So we have this exhibition by William Yang here. It's called Flaming Heritage. Um, and it's a body of work about his Chinese heritage from the beginning to the time when he was in China. And to have the conversation with William, of course, we, everybody knows and loves Ben Law. And, um, and they have quite a lot of um, great times together. Um, in fact, you can see one of Ben's uh, very interesting portrait oh, yeah. over there. <laughs> um, so I would like you all to uh, your hand together for William and Ben. Thank you, Simon, and thank you so much for coming here today. It's such a pleasure to be here with you um, here on Gwaigal, Gadigal, and Bidjigal land. Uh, First Nations people have been well, making art and sharing stories for tens of thousands of years. Uh, together they constitute the oldest continuous living culture on the planet. Very grateful that we can continue sharing stories and making art here on Aboriginal land. William, you and I, it feels like our friendship has been defined by these in-conversation events over the years, possibly decades. And when we came here today, we were just thinking, well, maybe we'll just have a chat and just let everyone kind of be voyeurs into it. So we're going to start with William's full sexual and medical history. <laughs> <laughs> I want to start at the end in a way, because when it's 2021, we've got a retrospective at the Queensland Art Gallery called Seeing and Being Seen. And my memories of that opening night at the Queensland Art Gallery are quite apocalyptic because there was very, very heavy rain that was preventing people to, from even getting to the exhibition. Um, COVID was still a thing, so I think we might have been in between lockdowns at that stage. And I remember commenting to you, it feels like it's the final episode in the TV show that is William Young's life. How did you regard the exhibition, now looking back? Um, first of all, thank you for pronouncing my name correctly. I try, I <laughs> young, try. It's young, people, people uh, although since everyone thinks it's Yang, um, I, it's like stopping the tie, <laughs> but, but it's not nice that, that um, uh, um, properly pronounced. Um, I don't remember the rain, actually, of that <laughs> I was probably so full of myself. I, <laughs> I, I didn't, didn't notice the elements. But, um, uh, no, no, it was a terribly exciting and fulfilling evening for me. And, um, so I, fe I felt recognised, and it's just one of those um, things where uh, you think you could die happy at that moment. <laughs> yeah. It was a beautiful exhibition, and for those of you who weren't able to make it physically, it occupied such a large space, and I think people who were there that evening got a full idea of how broad your work actually spans. It spans portraits, it spans queer history, it spans Chinese-Australian history, it spans landscape, um, and it became uh, a, a book over there that is actually officially sold out, so I'm actually very surprised to see it over there. If you actually get a copy of that book here, you're actually you, you very lucky. No, no, it's been reprinted. Oh. Simon, Simon actually financed the reprinting of no this way. book. I mean, in some ways, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Simon. Because it did sell out very quickly. It, it did, but it's peculiar because it's run by, it's, it's done under Kogoma auspices, but it's somehow managed by the bookshop. Mm -hmm. And the two organisations don't talk to each other, really. You're getting a very they're... deep sense into the bureaucracy <laughs> of Australian publishing now. Yeah, that's right. And they're selling it for $50, which I mean, it's worth $90 if it's worth a dollar. <laughs> and, and anyway, so, um, so, so Simon, through their system, kind of paid a huge amount of money to... Um, to, to um, 
get the book republished. Mm. And um, uh, so, uh, and they're still selling it for $50. Like, can't <laughs> <laughs> laugh, at least charge $70 and recoup the bit of money. But no, it doesn't work like that. What you're saying is tips are welcome. <laughs> $40 tip per book. <laughs> When, when we went to the exhibition, those of us who saw it, it's, it's quite expansive and all encapsulating. Um, it, it produces and yields a book. I'm wondering, what, how do you go from an exhibition that large to something here today that's quite curated? And even if you think about the Chinese Australian works of your repertoire, even that's quite substantial. Where do you start with selecting what we see here today? Um, well, Firstly, I've got a collection of works and I, I don't take as many photographs now, but um, I remix the ones I've got. This is the way I look at them. They're kind of remixes all my, all my works. And it's, it's good because, for example, with this exhibition, I was very happy with how the story's been condensed and touches upon China. All, all the all the moments uh, are here, and um, so and so, some people don't don't know my work. Some people know my work a lot, but some people don't. And so it's always good to have a new offering. Mm. I'm particularly besotted. I mean, I'm besotted by all of the photos, really. But when I look over there, it feels like over there is the beginning of a story and I'm interested in knowing what the story is represented by those two particular photos. The man wearing a tuxedo with, I think, is a tenor saxophone or maybe it's an alto saxophone and the image next to him of quite a beautiful woman with curls um, and, and the writing over it. When, what are their stories and where does the story begin? Uh, my mother and my father um, were born in Australia. That's the most important thing about them. Their, um, both their, their parents came over mm. from southern China. My father was a Hakka, that was his clan. My mother was a Siyap. Mm. My father spoke Hakka and my mother spoke Cantonese. So they spoke English to each other. <laughs> so, English was the only language that they, was their common language. Um, so, my mother, my father was actually more traditionally Chinese than my mother. In what ways? He kept the customs and my mother was very keen for us to assimilate and not stand out. And I actually tell that story, the, the, that story, my uncle was murdered in that photograph there and so I, I kind of relate this story that my mother wanted us to assimilate quite badly to my uncle's murder because um, it left an impression on her that um, you didn't want to stand out, or you didn't want to be too Chinese. That's the conclusion I drew. But anyway, my mother was keen on us to assimilate, be Australian, um, whereas my father was more traditional. And I, there, there's one incident that I, I remember was that my father was quite Chinese in his ways, and often when he was talking to someone, he'd squat in the um, <laughs> Chinese tradition. He'd, should, should we demonstrate now? <laughs> <laughs> We've got a squat t-shirt. <laughs> squat club. And my mother would hate that because it kind of um, it, it kind of signaled that he was not Australian or something just by his actions. And so she, she At the she, same time, you know, we can't do guys this. <laughs> You I know. know. So I know that's that, that's the blind spot. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so if your father was more <laughs> traditionally, she just didn't see race people. No. <laughs> if, if your father was more traditionally Chinese and your mother wanted you all to assimilate, 
from from the perspective of safety, it sounds like from an impulse yes. of safety and and protecting you from what might happen to you. That yes, she would, that's right. She knew the consequences quite intimately. So if he was more of a traditionalist, she was more of an assimilationist. As you were growing up, where did that leave you? Um, I mean, where did it leave this kid? This is you. <laughs> oh, 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 well, um, I was very close to my mother, actually, and uh, kind of distant from my father. So um, I, uh, I took all my cues from my mother. And I think most people do, because they're the nurturers, the mothers are the nurturers. Mm. But um, I took all my social cues from my mother. Mm. And so therefore your social cues were be like, I'm, a, I'm Australian. Yes, yes, and, and yes. What is your perception or concept of Chinese-ness? Um, you know, did you think of yourself as, as Chinese when you were growing up and did that change depending on what age you were? Um, well, I was kind of in denial about being Chinese. I mean, I knew I was Chinese, mm -hmm. but um, um, I, I identified with being Australian very strongly, of course, of course, because so one identifies with one's cultural environment. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I, I guess, I never had that conversation about being Asian to myself. Mm. And I can remember when I came down to Sydney um, from Brisbane, and I, I was like 24 or something, um, nobody knew me in Sydney. And I, the, the people would make assumptions, we all make assumptions, and they say, are you a Colombo student? <laughs> <laughs> and I'd say, yes, <laughs> just to shut down the argument or the discussion, and I'd move on to another subject. And so so that's, that's like my denial. Yeah. And, and to explain for those of us who, who mightn't be aware, the Colombo students were kind of the students who kind of came to Australia, especially post Tiananmen, there was Oh, much earlier, much earlier, much earlier than, than that. Yeah, much earlier than that. And it was about in, um, engaging, engaging the more Asian region yes. with, with Australia. Yes. Yeah. So they assumed you were a Colombo student. Yes. <laughs> but if that if that wasn't your narrative, that wasn't your truth, obviously. What was the story you were telling yourself about your Chineseness at the time? Well, I, I wasn't. I blocked it out, mm. so there was no story. Yeah. So that when I did actually claim my Chinese heritage when I was in my mid-thirties. Um, it was like a religious experiment. And um, this, is the, this is the photograph that, that, um, that uh, explains that. I'll read it actually, because it's good. I learned Taoism, the Chinese philosophy, and this led me to embracing my Chinese heritage, which hitherto had been denied and unacknowledged. People at the time called me born-again Chinese. <laughs> and that's not a bad description, as there was a certain zealousness in the process. But now I see it as a liberation from racial suppression, and I prefer to say I came out as a Chinese. <laughs> read out that extract, I hear, I, I'm struck by two things, or there are two things that are resonating in my brain. One is uh, the artist Lindy Lee. She also talks about her connection to Taoism, and she similarly grew up in Queensland, uh, didn't s s really speak Chinese, and, and then the Taoism was kind of a breakthrough there. I also feel like there's an interesting parallel between when you come out as gay, for instance, to yourself and to other people, there's always that period of being quite aggressively gay, you know, like yes. everything has to be gay and all I'll talk about is gay and <laughs> gay politics because our, our development has kind of been arrested. We didn't get those milestones that heterosexual people had, so we claim it more aggressively. And it feels like that's what you're talking about here. That yes, you've absolutely. Been denied something that you're now embracing almost with an aggression. Yeah, well, I think that that's, that's a process. It happens, like, with gay people, for example. Their sexuality has been suppressed, 
and then suddenly they liberate themselves. And I've seen this so many times where the, the gay person is 20, 40, 60. They all want to wear skimpy shorts and be on a, be on a float at the Mardi Gras and be a big slut. <laughs> we're a slut positive space, by the way. <laughs> And I feel like it, almost like the, the longer you leave it, the more intense the reaction <laughs> it can be sometimes. Uh -huh. yes. <laughs> so tell me about this period when people are saying that you're a born again Chinese. Who's calling you that? Are the Chinese oh, I, I, people? I'm, I'm yeah. describing myself as yeah. born again. No, wait a minute. Hmm. They, they did. No, no I heard someone people say... People at the time called me Yeah, they again. did. Born again Chinese. He's born again Chinese. Yes, and was, they that, did say was that, that Chinese-Australian people? Or was oh, that non-Chinese people? My yeah. Friends, yeah. I'm also interested in your relationship to other Chinese-Australian, more broadly Asian-Australian people, because when I was growing up, it was very much a white part of, of Queensland. And besides my family, I didn't really grow up within a very strong Asian community outside of my family. So I, looking back, I almost had like an ambivalent relationship to not just my Chineseness, but about Chi Chineseness in general. How did those dynamics evolve and change for you once you decide that you are a born again Chinese? How do you see other Chinese Australians differently? Are you drawn to them more, more interested in their story? Or does it not change? Uh, no. Um it opens a conversation, and what I discovered was that really, you talked about Lindy Lee, mm. I'll talk about Annette Chun Wu. Mm -hmm. We all had the same experiences, really. Mm. And um, there are various degrees of Chineseness. For example, Annette can speak Cantonese, or she had a stepmother who couldn't speak English, mm -hmm. and so she could, could speak could speak uh, Cantonese, but our experiences are much the same, mm. really. Um, and uh, we identify with being Australian. We t take on the culture, of course, because there's nothing else left to do. And I find, if we jump to the end of the story, where I tr go back to China, and I try to be Chinese, <laughs> I thought that I could be Chinese once I could went back to China and it was a positive experience I really liked it um, and the Chinese welcomed me back or the ones that I met on that first trip more than subsequent trips but <laughs> on that first trip but that, 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 they said you've come back you've come back you've come back home you have Chinese blood that was the mantra that they were all saying to me and so that that was terrific but I found then that um, even though I had these wonderful experiences, um, I assessed them all from a, an Australian point of view. <laughs> and in fact, all my best experiences of China reinforced the fact that I was Australian. <laughs> so, but I, I've kind of come to accept that. And, um, uh, and, and um, yeah, I, I like my Chinese experiences, mm. yes. You bring up Annette Shun War, and for those of you who don't know Annette, she is a theatre maker, a collaborator with, yes. with you as well. She's, she's a broadcaster and um, currently the head of contemporary Asian-Australian performance. She's a powerhouse in terms of theatre. But when, when Annette and I talk about the issues that you're raising right now, I've, I've, all, I've always been struck by almost a sense of defiance from her when talking about issues of identity. You know, people have asked her, well, can you speak Mandarin? And she's like, why, why would I be able to speak Mandarin? She does speak some Cantonese, yes. but not, not completely fluently to the point where you can have a sophisticated conversation. And, but she also defiantly says, well, why should I? You know, no one offers that question to say, German Australians who've lost a language within one generation. No one ex expects you to be able to speak Swedish after one generation. But even though you and Annette have been here for many generations, your family, there is still that question of why can't you speak this, make this, do this food, know the ins and outs, the Wikipedia version of Taoism. Do, do you feel that sense of defiance or have you 
kind of gotten to a different place with when people present those notions to you? I wouldn't say I was a defiant person, but um, <laughs> uh, I've tried to learn the language. Mm -hmm. I, for my first trip back to China, I tried to learn Mandarin. I went to several courses. And um, how did you go? Well, <laughs> I got to China and they couldn't understand a word I said. <laughs> I felt so demoralised <laughs> and I just gave up after that. So I, in, an, in another life I'll learn the language. <laughs> it's just too hard. Other people sometimes are bothered by that, like by the fact that my Cantonese is quite rough and I've had to kind of come to peace with how I feel about that. Do you know what I mean? Like whether yes. I'm okay with it. How, how do you feel about those sorts of things? Do you feel it's a shortcoming or do you feel oh, it's I, like, I'd well, why should I be speaking talk. Mandarin? I'd love to talk, but I, I just, I've done nothing to, um, it's become a story that I can't talk it, but, but I should really just shut up and learn it. <laughs> In fact, I, I can't, it's just too hard. It's a difficult language. I'm not good at languages, mm -hmm. so I just, I've just, and uh, save myself the heartache. <laughs> I want to go through more of these photos almost okay. one by one, but I want to pick up on something you said before about how your <laughs> homecoming started off being quite successful and welcoming, and you said on subsequent trips, not so much. I can't let that comment go by. What, what happened on subsequent trips? <laughs> right, Were you detained okay, by okay. the CCP? <laughs> what, what happened? <laughs> no, I don't think I had the... the, the, the First time I went to China, I was kind of looked after by Chinese people. I, I, I stayed in homes, I never stayed in a hotel. And so I had a great friend there called um, Mr. Bao, who was a photographer who I befriended in Australia. And um, he was determined to show me China, because the great they're very nationalistic, the Chinese. Mm. He wanted to show me China, and which he did, and I'm certainly appreciative of him for, for that. Um, so that, that was a very warm trip, and that's the only time I went to China where I just completely went into people's houses, mm. whereas like in subsequent trips, it's all been hotels. Mm. So I, I haven't stayed in a... Chinese um, home for, for ages. Mm. So the, there was that intimacy. Um, what, what was the other part of the question? Oh, I'm just being a busybody now. I was just keen to know when you implied that the first trip was very welcoming and successful. You said subsequent trips, not so much. <laughs> Is there oh, a story I think that they've changed. I think they've yeah. changed because mm. um, Westerners were, when I first, they, they were a complete anomaly, you know, like they didn't see anyone, uh, see that many people. But now I think that there's a different generation and there's more of a commercial attitude towards you, you know, if you want to buy this or something like that, or you're rich was always the assumption mm. that you're rich, which annoyed me because I didn't consider myself as rich. Mm. Although on consideration, I'm probably ri richer relatively than they were. Mm. But I wasn't a millionaire, mm. and that really annoyed me. <laughs> and <laughs> and um, so, yeah, yeah it's, it, I've moved from kind of, personal kind of relationships to more professional. I, I go over there with a purpose to take photographs or um, I'm doing a show or something like that. So, mm. so it's, it, 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 yeah, it's, it's, it's different now. And China has changed a lot. It, it cha seems to change very fast, China. Mm. Uh, but uh, it, in some places, I found, in some places, mm. in, the, in the big cities. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, look, we're talking about a country where in one generation, you know, poverty has, and the equation of poverty has changed so dramatically. I'm curious, when you talk about having done shows there, I mean, here in Australia, it, it, I think 
basically every major art gallery has in their permanent collection works by William Young and a lot of the other galleries too. You also have exhibited overseas. You know, photography is special because it transcends language. I mean, you incorporate language in your works, but the works tell their own stories through images. What's the difference between the reaction that you get to your work here in Australia versus when you're engaging with a Chinese or more broadly Asian audience? Ooh, uh -uh. Anything strikes you as interesting or memorable? Uh, I don't seem to, I haven't had that many. I've done performances in mm -hmm. China, not so many exhibitions. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that I've got much feedback back from them mm -hmm. just to know what they thought of it. And also, I like to show gay works in China, just being political. You know, just <laughs> <laughs> introducing the conversation is really what I, I, I like to do. Through explicit images. Uh, and, and they can't, they can't really arrest me because I'm Western. Whereas I, I'm, I'm kind of doing it on behalf of the gay Chinese. Mm. This is the way I see it. Because yeah. I'm kind of safe. If they did it, they'd probably regret it or something like that. Mm. Uh, I, I originally came across your work through your performance works, actually, yeah. before I came to your stills exhibition. So. Um, for those of you who don't know, William, I think since the late 1980s, right, you've been performing monologue slideshow in a kind of hybrid theatrical photography experience. Yes. Um, and it spanned, how many performances have you done now? It's about 12, I think, 12 full length performances. Uh huh. And so when you're devising those, works, you know, to lead us through the process of that, especially the works that focus on the Chinese-Australian story, um, what's that process like? Um, because it's very different to just curating a, a, um, an exhibition, for instance. Uh, uh, since the works are autobiographical, <clears throat> in fact, I've got to have lived the experience of the piece, and so I find that every four years or something, I could just draw on my life experiences and there'd be enough there to make a piece. And I've done most of the ones on my family. I've done, I'm probably due to take, um, I'm due to do another one of, of my family now. Um, and, um, I guess I get an idea, mm. I've got the photos, and I just put it together. Mm. And um, I've never talked about my next, well, let's talk about the next one that I could do. Uh, uh, my sister died a few years ago, and so I'm the last per member of my family here. And so my sister, married a Japanese America, American and she lived in America for the past 50 years of her life. Mm. And um, she had a family over there, three boys who are now in their 40s, and I'm very close to them. And so she died a few years ago and I think that there's a story there. Mm. Uh, but I'm actually becoming, I'd really like to tell her story, but I just wonder if I could. I'm becoming more se sensitive to telling stories. Uh, I I'm losing my nerve a bit, actually. Mm. Is is what what is happening? Whether what's changed? Uh, I've gotten older. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it happens. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> probably I've, got, I've probably got a um, uh, I'm not as bold as I used to be, and you think, mm. oh, I shouldn't say that. Is like one of the, mm. the the phrases that goes on in my brain. Mm. Whereas with, when I was younger, I'd say, of course I can say that. You yeah. Know? Yeah. So that that's that's you just become more 
reserved, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Or more sensitive. Sensitive, yes. Arguably. Um, can you tell us another story? Because we like listening to your stories. <laughs> and I'm wondering if you could tell us a story about a photograph that's on display here that we might not necessarily get just by looking at the photo itself because some of the photos come with quite a bit of context there is actually written text there that's giving us a story but what's a photograph here that has an interesting story that we wouldn't know just by looking at it um ben which one ben oh, <laughs> <laughs> i love the story well, okay, there's the <laughs> photograph of you, Ben. There is. Which I took. We, we just shot from, that in Melbourne. Yeah, that was quite a while ago. Yes. I look different now. You and, um, yeah. mm. <laughs> I, I, It's a slight plagiarisation because I saw a photo of Ben's in his scrapbook or Facebook, Facebook or something yeah. where he, he was going to a party and he painted on a beard onto, uh, for the party. And I love that photograph, and so I just extended it to more body hair. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I, I thought you were ter terrifically sporting to do it, actually. <laughs> Up for anything, for you, Young. Yes, I can. <laughs> and, and so I, I like it because it is, what it says is, is that th there's maybe, um, because Asians are, are, are smooth and uh, they don't have body hair, that it's a kind of, it, it, I, I, I made it out to be a kind of envy that one did not have body hair. <laughs> it's hair envy. Um, and some extra context is that photograph that William saw originally on my Facebook. It was a going away party for a friend of mine called Mika Gosta, who's an incredibly hairy man uh, to the point where his flatmates used to shave his back in the kitchen oh my God. Uh, with, with clippers and what? the final the final theme for his going away party was dressed as Mika and so I feel like the spirit of Mika kind of lives on there but while we're talking about naked slash semi-naked men let's also talk about this incredibly striking and iconic photo here it's taken in 2000 it's called Alter Ego 